So this session um, is always uh, one of the most moving um, pieces of any workshop or institute that we do. You get to both hear uh, um, somebody who lived through an experience that we're thinking about and talking about, um, talk about it from that lived, lived place, and you get to see somebody modeling um, oral history and ha what it is to, um, uh, to, to do an oral history. Um, Roz Hinton, who um, is with us today to do the oral history, has worked with the Jewish Women's Archive in the past. If you look at our site, you'll find something called Katrina's Jewish Voices shortly after the um, uh, hurricanes in um, New Orleans and uh, the Gulf Coast. We decided that um, here was one of the oldest Jewish communities in the United States. It was significantly affected by um, the hurricanes in a number of ways. Um, the devastation not only affected that community, also affected how they behaved in relation to other communities, and affected actually the rest of the American Jewish community and how it took care of, um, how it responded to what happened in New Orleans. And it seemed like a very important story to tell. Um, we didn't see anybody else um, going ready to tell it, um, it was our form as an organization at that moment of social justice or social action. We partnered with the Institute for Southern Jewish Life. Um, we were very fortunate that at the time, um, Roz, who is had newly moved to the Bay Area, but at that time Roz was living um, at least part-time in um, New Orleans. And um, you'll, if you get a chance to look at those oral histories, they're um, very well done, and we were working with a real pro. So I'm delighted that Roz has joined us here today, um, and that you get to see her at work. And I will let her take it from here and introduce Karen. Um, no big introduction, because we'll be hearing a lot from Karen. Well, thank you, Gail. This is a wonderful organization, and I'm done uh, uh, Jewish Women Who Dared in Chicago, too, and these have been marvelous interviews that, uh, that I'm always able to do, and including this one today. Um, Karen is, uh, we just met two weeks ago, and we had a lovely session for a couple of hours, which you don't always get before you do an oral history. Um, and she is, at this point, a senior trial consultant at NJP Litigation Consulting, which it used to be the National Jury Project, uh, which some of us might know it by that name. And she's the only, you're the only non-lawyer as a consultant there, but, but, you're, no, but you're also been the only attorney, a non-attorney, who was a head president of the National Lawyers Guild. And that story, because that's the little more radical wing of the lawyers, associations. Um, and that story is going to be part of what we're going to talk about today. And I really don't want to take any more time telling you about Karen, except through her telling you about herself. So let's get right into it and, and start um, first with some of your family background, Karen. Um, and uh, you didn't grow up in California. You grew up on the East Coast, so why don't you tell us a little about your family okay. and your growing up. Right. So both my parents are immigrants. Karen, you need to speak up. Because both my parents are immigrants. Um, my father's family was originally Kunyan, and the immigration officer was Irish, so we became Kunyan. And uh, all of his, uh, my grandfather's brothers and sisters came over pretty much at the same time, except for one brother who ended up in Argentina. And my grandmother used to say, oh, I should have gone to Argentina, because he was the only Kunin who ever made any money. <laughs> and my mother, uh, when my mother married my birth father when she was 18, her mother came up to her and said, thank God, now you're safe, And because she was marrying a citizen. And it turned out that she wasn't born in Chicago like she always thought she was. She was born in Poland. And my grandmother, who was an illiterate garment worker, spoke five languages. She, she was from Odessa, and then she had my aunt in Odessa, and then she had my mother in Poland, and she had my other aunt in Havana. Hmm. And so at the end of her life, what she remembered was 
all the anti-Semitic curses in all these different <laughs> languages, you know, Russian and Polish and Spanish. But she ended up in New York, and that's where I grew up in New York. And you, this was a great influence on you for this story of going to Mississippi, because your grandmother was a great influence in her work. And she was a socialist? No, or? no, she was just a good union member. She was a garment worker. She, uh, her, uh, my grandfather deserted the family when my mother was 10 or 12 years old. And my grandmother supported three girls. And um, mm -hmm. she was a garment worker, and she ended up living in the ILGWU housing project in, uh, in Chelsea, in New York, and, and she had a view of the Empire State Building, and you could never say anything bad about a union. And my father was also a member of the Butcher's Union. He was a butcher. He worked for someone else. And so I grew up, you know, it wasn't a really political family, but it was a union family. And my mother was a bohemian. She was a dancer. She dropped out of school uh, to understudy in um, a Broadway show called Pins and Needles, which was produced uh, in New York by the Garment Workers Union. And uh, she became, uh, her mentor became Benjamin Semach, who was, came out of the Moscow Art Theater, and he was the choreographer. And so he was kind of her father replacement. And years later, when I was in high school, we moved to L.A., because, partly because Benjamin was teaching at the University of Judaism. So we moved to L.A., and then I studied dance and drama with him, as well as my mother. We became beatniks. So um, how did your Judaism play out in your childhood, in your formation? Did you belong to a synagogue, or... Or what was the greatest manifestation in your mind of, of your Judaism? Well, I think growing up in the 50s, in the wake of World War II, there was just this awareness that, um, you know, I was born in 1945. I was born the day between Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. And um, my mother claimed she, she was just having a baby, so... It didn't really influence her, but I'm convinced it influenced me. But there was this sense, you know, growing up with the knowledge of the Holocaust and, um, you know, the, all the disconnects in the family, you know, everybody was, whether they were lost or not, nobody ever knew. You know, it was just, there were no more links to the old country. And so I grew up with that. And, um, but we were also the only Jewish family in an Irish Catholic neighborhood. And a neighborhood of railroad workers. And uh, my family was never very religious, but when my sister came home and said, told my mother she'd gone to confession, we started <laughs> celebrating Jewish holidays more regularly. <laughs> 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 so, um, but there was, so there was this growing up in, you know, the wake of World War II and the knowledge of the Holocaust, there was the Union thing, there was the sort of being the outsider in Mar on Marble Hill Avenue. There was my mother being different than all of the mothers because she was a bohemian and she wasn't, you know, she didn't go to the beauty parlor. And, you know. So there was always this sense of sort of being on the edge, being outside. Mm -hmm. Well, one of my first questions when I, when I saw when you went to Mississippi was it was after Freedom Summer, actually. It was in September. And it was after Cheney, Goodman, and Schwarmer had, were missing and killed. And I thought, how in the hell did your family let you go? <laughs> and so I asked you that question, and I'm going to ask it to you again, you know. So I spoke last year to a high school class, and they said, what did your mother say about you going? And I said, well, actually, my mother came, and we came to Mississippi as well. Oh. <laughs> she went to teach dance a few months after I went there. She went for a month. But I, w I had just finished my freshman year at UCLA where I was a dance major. And uh, some friends that I met at UCLA had gone to Mississippi summer. And, of course, I monitored it very closely. And uh, they came back and they said, everyone's leaving. You know, there were a thousand students that went from the north to Mississippi to register voters to teach people how to read, because there was a literacy test in order to vote. You had to 
know how to read and write. And uh, it, they, everyone was leaving. And so my friends from UCLA were going back, and I said, I'll go. I didn't even think about it. It was just the right thing to do. I mean, I had grown up watching uh, the news stories about the Freedom Rides, and uh, we were living in this sort of bohemian environment. My mother, actually in the 50s, studied with Pearl Primus, who was an African-American dancer, was one of the pioneers in bringing African, African dance to the United States. So she's, so I was always exposed to out being an outsider and being outside the box. And uh, it just seemed like the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. So I went. And what did Pearl Primus say when she heard you were going? So Pearl Primus and Catherine Dunham were the, sort of oh. the two icons of African dance in the United States. And Pearl uh, was my godmother. <laughs> my mother danced with her in the 50s and spent a summer in Trinidad helping her research her anthropology PhD thesis. Um, so I grew up exposed. And so uh, when I was in New York, before I went to Mississippi, I went to see her, and she tried to talk me out of it. And she had been persecuted during the McCarthy era. She was a friend of Paul Robeson's, and she was, you know, both through that association and also her own political uh, background, she was felt persecuted, and she was very afraid for me, and she tried to talk me out of going. But my mother was completely supportive, and uh, it was the right thing to do, and it just made sense. I mean, I really, it wasn't that I sat down and weighed everything. I just, my friends were there, They there was a need, and all right, I'll take some time off and go do that. Go teach children how to read and teach grown-ups how to pass a literacy test. That was what was in my mind. Mm -hmm. So why don't you tell us how you got there? Because you, you said you were in the East Coast, and and your journey to um, to Mississippi, to Indianola, Mississippi. Uh, so why don't you talk about that a minute, if you don't mind. So I, had, I grew up with a sister who was 14 months older than me. And when my mother left for California, she told us we could come join her after she got settled. And my sister uh, didn't. She went to live with our paternal grandmother in Norfolk, Virginia. So, and there, the Jewish community in Norfolk is very insular and pretty racist. And so my sister kind of got sucked into that life. And I, so she kind of sided with my father's side of the family, and I sided with my mother and went to California to become a Phoenix. But my sister had just had a baby. And so my mother and I met in Norfolk to see my niece. And uh, her husband was a, was a southerner, and he didn't like what I was doing, and he didn't. He was rude to my mother, and I got my sister very upset with him because I thought he was too rude. And um, so he so it came to the house one day and said he had arranged for a ride for me to go to Indianola, and uh, it turned out he said they, they, these were two guys who were who worked for him. And turned out they were white Mississippians, and they didn't work for him. They were just doing one run. He owned a grocery chain or something. And so I went on this truck, and, one, and he told them that I was a freedom rider. And so these were white Mississippians. So one of them raped me on the truck going 60 miles an hour down the highway in North Carolina. And I didn't feel like I could just get out in North Carolina. So I talked my way out of it, out of the truck in Atlanta, and got on a Trailways bus and went on to Indianola, Mississippi. So that was the that was the sort of the the solidification of the split in our family. And I didn't talk to my sister for 18 years after that. We eventually reconciled, but uh, it was a complete split in our family. <coughs> How do you heal from something like that? What What was the healing process? Um, well, because you had to be traumatized when you got to Mississippi, is my thought. Well, I got there, and uh, I got off the bus. I'm sitting in a gas station, and these white guys come up to me, and they say, Where are you from? And I said, I'm from Norfolk, 
Virginia. <laughs> and then this car, I, I got a payphone and called my friend who was there, and he and uh, one of the local African American leaders came and picked me up and uh, took me into the bosom of the black community. And that's how I healed, because this was a real community. It was at Indianola, Mississippi, had uh, 7,000 people, 50% black, 50% white. It was the founding place of the White Citizens Council. It was Fannie Lou Hamer's uh, home county. And she was in and out then, because she was already sort of making a national uh, name for herself. And uh, the day I arrived, two babies, two twins, had just died of starvation. And it kind of put things in perspective pretty quickly. And then as I got to know some of the women there, I found out other people had been raped. I wasn't the only person in the world who had been raped. And there was a racial component to their rapes in the way that there was to mine as well. But the thing that really was most healing was that I was part of a movement. And what I was telling Rosalind when we talked, this I've never experienced anything since. I didn't experience anything before like this or anything since. But of that, that 3,000 people who made up the African American community, maybe 80% were not just sympathetic, they were involved. They came to meetings. They tried to register to vote. They uh, took literacy classes. They marched on the library and the swimming pool. And they were putting their lives at risk every day. One of the first things I learned when I got there was when you walked, at, well, because there was pavement on one side of the railroad tracks. There really was railroad tracks. Pavement on one side, dirt roads on the other, electricity and running water on one side only partial electricity and running water in the other. It was really a movie. I mean, it was just like so stereotypical southern town. And the first thing I was taught was when you walk down the road, if you hear a car, which there weren't that many of, you turn around, and if there's white people in the car, you get way off the road because they will run you down. So that was one of my first lessons. And But a, despite that, despite the violence that was just always there, always under the surface, um, there was this sense of community and belonging and making history and being in this together. And that put everything in perspective. And it was, the end, it was September 64, and the three civil rights workers had just been killed. And, um, you know, I was alive. And I was doing what I needed to do. So, where did you live? Um, well, I, at first I stayed with uh, Mrs. McGee, and then I moved over to Mrs. Magruder's house where other people were staying. And uh, about four days after I got there, uh, I got someone came running to Mrs. McGee's house saying, uh, you have to come to the phone. I had to go to someone else's house to a phone. And my friend who from L.A. Call, called and said, we've all just been arrested at Mrs. Magruder's house. And they didn't know I was there because I was at a different house. Uh, go down to the Freedom School because the car is open, the school's open. Call the Jackson office and tell them that we've been arrested and, you know, get a lawyer. So I was 19 years old. And I took the longest walk of my life. And I went down, and about a half a block from the school, there was a little grocery store with, uh, owned by uh, a family, Mr. and Mrs. Giles, who were leaders in the movement. And they then went with me to the school. Uh, and about six hours later, Stokely Carmichael came and saved the day. <laughs> I don't know if people know who Stokely Carmichael mm -hmm. is, but he was the guy who sort of promoted black power, you know, several years later. But to me, he was a lifesaver. And uh, when I went back many years later for a reunion, that walk, which in my mind took hours and was the scariest walk of my life, was three blocks or four blocks. <laughs> it was just like, I couldn't believe it. It was so short. And in my mind, it was such a long walk. And so 
Uh, that was my introduction, my second introduction to Indian law. So, you, what, what else with the Freedom Schools was involved with the Freedom Schools that you had? What, what did it look like? Even? Kind of paint a picture for our friends here today. So, it was uh, one room with a little partitioned office. It was a brick building that was the first school for African Americans. It was a church-owned building. It had been the first school for African Americans in the county. And now, by the time I got there, there was a public black school uh, a few blocks away. But um, it was church-owned. And we had, there was like a big meeting room. And we, the movement a lot was about mass meetings. It was people getting together, speaking truth, speaking their own experience, singing. The music was, the singing was the thing that really got us through. But we would have classes, and there was a library, and it wasn't just being part of this community. We had received clothes and books and, you know, resources from the North. There was this whole network, Friends of SNCC, and um, this whole community across the country, and they, we had this amazing library, and I started to read African American history that I'd never been exposed to, even though my mother was an African dancer. You know, I grew up in this Irish Catholic neighborhood, and we didn't read too much to begin with, and we certainly didn't read African American history, and I read books that I had never even known existed, and, um, and I taught reading. I didn't know how to teach reading, but I taught reading, and... Uh, I taught, I, I taught people how to, uh, I taught people a technique I used when I had essay tests in school and I didn't know the answer, which was to take the question and turn it into a statement. So to pass the literacy test to vote, they would give people a section of the Mississippi Constitution and ask them to interpret it. So I taught them how to take this, the, the section and rearrange the words. And uh, I worked with Mr. and Mrs. Giles' aunt, who was in her mid to late 80s. And she took the test four times. And then one day, they, uh, they sent someone over to get me to come to the store. And I walked into the store, and this little old lady was jumping up and down. I mean, this was 1964, 62. This must have been 65 by then. She was in her 80s, so she was born in the last century. Her parents were slaves. And she had registered to vote. Mm. And it was just the most amazing experience. So it was these kinds of experiences and the singing. I can't emphasize enough how much the singing was so important. And the, uh, the sense of being part of something and changing the world. It was, that's the thing that helped us get through all the turmoil and the, and the fear. When I went back, the thing that had changed most, the town was twice as big. The, the uh, cotton fields were now catfish farms, ruining the ecology of the area. But the fear was gone. The violence that was so right at the surface when I was there was gone. But what had replaced it was despair. And it was really, it was very sad to me because there wasn't that community. There were, there, the people who organized the reunion were the people who were the kids who hung around the Freedom School. And they were now in their 40s, and I was in my late 50s. And um, they remembered the Civil Rights Movement, but they weren't adults, so they wanted to sort of claim it, and they organized. They continue to have reunions. Next year will be the 50th anniversary. So, uh, you know, there was that, that sense of being part of something that was going to change the world. Mm -hmm. um, just some other questions about the experience in Mississippi. Did, did you ever go to jail? I mean, you certainly rescued somebody four days in. <laughs> I got taken in. I never got booked because they didn't have a cell for white women. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, know, I understood in the summer they uh, arrested some of the white women, but they didn't arrest the black women when they arrested the black women. <laughs> So they didn't want to integrate the jail. So I never got booked. I was well, one of. I think there were only two or three of us at the time, uh, white women in the project. So 
they were more interested in arresting the black woman than the white woman. So I never uh, got booked. We get, we kept getting picked up and taken in. One, um, we decided, four of us decided to take a break from Indianola, so we drove up to Memphis, which was about two and a half hours away. And on the way up, I was driving, and there were the two white people in the front and two black people in the back. And um, we were stopped. The police lights, we thought, this is it, we're dead. And the guy walked up to the car and he said, that's all right, little lady, I was going after someone else. He didn't see people in the back, kind of scooted down. So oh, we were relieved, we survived that. We get to Memphis, the first thing that happens is we get picked up and we get taken into the Memphis Police Department and questioned for about two or three hours and then they let us go. Riding so, while integrated, is that? Yes, <laughs> exactly. And we ended up at the Lorraine Motel, which was the only motel we could stay at in town. And we stayed there for two days. And basically didn't go outside. We just stayed in the motel and had pizza. Oh. <laughs> that was your break. That was our break. <laughs> and you know, you talked a little about Mrs. Magruder. And I wonder, because you moved to her house. And what was that like, being there? And, and what was she like? So Mrs. Magruder was one of the few people who never went to a meeting never registered to vote, never tried to register to vote, was, but she made our home open to the movement, to the project. And so we stayed there. There were different numbers of us at different times. And uh, the school got bombed twice. The first time it got bombed was, I think it was in November or December, and um, it wasn't bombed completely. And uh, I remember one of the kids came running to the house saying, the school's on fire, or the school's been bombed. And so I was on the phone with the Jackson SNCC office, and um, one of the other civil rights workers was looking out the window, and we had uh, headlights, I mean uh, spotlights, hooked up outside her house. And there was a car full of white men pulling up out to throw something at the house and he threw on the spotlights and they drove away. So, you know, there was always that danger. Eventually our house did get bombed and completely destroyed and eventually the school got bombed. But um, at that point, Mrs. Magruder, who never did anything, went into her bedroom and picked up a shotgun stood it up in the corner of the living room and started singing freedom songs. <laughs> and it was the only time I ever heard her sing freedom songs. And she just, you know, she cooked. That's what she did. She cooked for us. She cooked for other people. She went to church, and she just started cooking. It was like four kind of an apolitical Mrs. Ruger. Yeah. Too apolitical. Yeah, she was going to defend our house. You know, it, it raises a question for me, because I've talked to some other colleagues, too, who are from Hattiesburg, about a nonviolent movement and guns. And so I just wonder if you saw the presence of other guns, and, and what was that like? Well, two of the SNCC workers went out, one black and one white, went out with one of the farmers and did some target practice one day. And uh, two of us women got very upset about it because we weren't invited. <laughs> this was like the beginning of my women's liberation. <laughs> like, well, you can learn how to shoot a gun, why can't I? <laughs> but, um, you know, it was just, it was, you know, the violence was there. And so it was just, all right, we're going to go on this demonstration. We're going to let them attack us. You know, we're going to not resist. Because if you resisted, you were dead. But that was different than Mrs. Magruder defending our house. You know, that was different than knowing how to, uh, you know, being attacked at a demonstration is different than being bombed. And I think that was kind of a line for people. Hmm. Okay. It's interesting. Um, so, 
Are there any other stories? I, I, I do have another follow-up in the Freedom School. Is what, what did you teach? I mean, how did, how did you teach? And were there any discussions about what you were going to use as books? And yeah, there was, a, there was a big debate about, we were teaching people how to read, so what material are you going to use? <laughs> right? So I remember a big debate about uh, one of my colleagues was uh, teaching, using uh, The Old Man in the Sea. <laughs> And uh, two of the guys came back from being in one of the smaller towns where they were chased. They had a car chase to get back safely. And they walked in, and people were reading Hemingway. <laughs> they were like, this doesn't work for us, you know. <laughs> and there's a big debate about it. And I never participated in the debates. I was 19 years old. I was a dance major. You know, I was like, I, I taught dance. I taught basic literacy. I mostly I taught the Mississippi Constitution, you know, how to read the Mississippi Constitution. I didn't, you know, I was just listening and learning and, you know, trying to sort it all out. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of debates, a lot of debates about nonviolence, about, you know, black history versus, you know, white culture. All of that stuff. It wasn't called black history then, it's African American history. So was. Who are your favorite authors coming out of that era? Who well, did you the like thing, to read? The, uh, I, uh, I took some time off in December, came north, and I brought uh, Du Bois's uh, Black Reconstruction. And I read that whole big, thick book all the way through for a week. And it really, you know, it really changed my view about things. It really educated me. And, you know, I started reading more African American history. But... I think later, when I got back to California, I started reading James Baldwin, mm -hmm. and that, I think more than anybody, uh, I was educated by James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. I remember the fire next time, and it was so, it spoke so much to my experience. And talk a little about the bombings, because what, what a fearful time to be there. What happened? that you recall? Well, the first bombing, they didn't bomb the school completely. And so we had, you know, we were trying to get people in the north to raise money to rebuild the school, and, and you know, we were still trying to, uh, you know, integrate the various public accommodations, and uh, we tried to integrate the library, and then they built a black library in a storefront that had one dictionary in it. You know, so people boycotted the black library. The window got mysteriously broken. That was one of the times we got taken in. Um, but um, I lost my train of thought. Oh, well, just what happened after oh, the Oh, so bombings? after the bombing, my mother, the beatnik, called John Doerr, who was the head of the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department, and said... My daughter's life's in danger. Do something. <laughs> so he sent two FBI agents to interview me. And they said, oh, well, has anyone come up to you and said they're going to kill you? And I said, uh, no. They were from Mississippi. They were white. Um, and uh, nobody's walked up. They bombed the school. They tried to bomb the house. But no, no one's come up and said, I'm going to kill you. And they said, well, then there's nothing we can do. So they got in their car. This was the turning point. I talk about stories because I'm involved in a lot of my work is helping lawyers tell stories to juries. So the, to me, the, the, the key part of storytelling is finding the turning points. Because the turning point is where the choices get made. And that's often the, the, the focus of a lot of legal cases, understanding those choices. Um, so this was the turning point in my life. This was it. So these guys, these FBI agents, are sitting in a car outside the house, and a car full of white guys pull up, and one of them's a deputy sheriff, and a couple of them jump out and grab one of the white civil rights workers and start beating him up. And I'm standing next to this car full of FBI agents, these two FBI agents, screaming, do something, do something. 
And they said, it's not in our jurisdiction. <laughs> and it, that, for me, was the turning point. That was when I realized this wasn't just about some poor, ignorant rednecks that you had to isolate and you had to just teach people how to read and then things would change. This was a structural problem. This was a, a whole national system. And it, it just set me on a different course for the rest of my life. Hmm. And so, um, what you you're you've told a lot of stories about Mississippi and um, about the structural violence. Is there a way to express your Judaism, or is there a way it even came up? Is there a way you were asked about it? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. The the kids when they heard I was Jewish, they couldn't believe it because I wasn't rich. Hmm. <laughs> and the only Jew that they had ever heard about was the, the family that owned the bank. Hmm. And they just couldn't believe that I was Jewish. <laughs> so it came up, you know. And so I talked about my family and the working class part of being Jewish. And, um, Mm -hmm. But it was a, it was a curiosity in the same way that my hair was a curiosity. I had very long hair then, and so there, you know, there, I I was a curiosity. But um, you know, I tried to talk about why I was there. It was very much tied to my sense of uh, you know, my father was in the army in World War II, and you know, the same mentality that you know was responsible for killing all these millions of Jews is the same mentality that we saw every day in Indianola. And I very much felt that connection, mm -hmm. which I have continued to try to build. As I, I had, uh, many years later, I had two daughters who are biracial. And when we celebrated Hanukkah, we lit the Hanukkah candles and sang freedom songs. Mm -hmm. And uh, one year, I, I made a Seder. And we, instead of passing around a Haggadah, we passed around a book of slave stories. Mm. And so we've always tried to, try to link those heritage and very much felt that, that connection in that, in that heritage. Well, so you're moving uh, with me or ahead of me a little bit, and let's get out of Mississippi here. And let's, let's talk about why you leave Mississippi and where you head and... Um, you know, and how big the movement is because you're involved in the movement from California. Right. So uh, I let the the second time the school got bombed was in April of '65, right after the Montgomery to Selma march, Selma to Montgomery march, and we we were sitting in Indianola watching it on television, and um, uh, the school got bombed and the project fell apart. And so uh, the project director and a couple other people were going to, this, this was when Johnson was starting the poverty program. And so they were going to go get real jobs and work in the poverty program. And I decided to go back to New York and try to be a dancer and work with Pearl Primus. And after six months of typing the same form over and over again all day, every day at a, at a bank in Wall Street, I decided it was time to go back to school. So I went back to California. But by then, I was in the movement. And for, all, for, for a lot of people in my generation, it was the movement. You know, it was just the movement. And so wherever there needed to be people to make change, we were all part of the same thing. So it was, uh, I went back to UCLA, and I became the LA representative for a SNCC newspaper called the Movement Newspaper. And uh, it was just, you know, uh, sort of a natural progression to get involved in the anti-war movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement, and the women's movement later. And I ended up moving back up here uh, to San Francisco to work full-time on this newspaper and got very involved in organizing anti-draft, anti-war demonstrations. How is that different? How is the anti-war movement different from the civil rights movement? Have you ever thought about that? Well, the composition was different. And we, you know, we saw our role on the movie newspaper. So this was as Black Power was developing and Stokely would come through and 
uh, Rap Brown, Jamil Alameen would come through, the leaders of SNCC. And we sort of saw it started to take on our responsibility was to to teach white people about black power and uh, you know to try to demystify it and make it less threatening and less scary and you know sort of talk about because we had been part of this uh, beloved community as SNCC used to call it and there were a lot of contradictions in it there were a lot of challenges there were a lot of um, divisions that you know, it was wonderful to be part of this beloved community, but you couldn't ignore the history and the, the different paths that people came from. And so for us at that point, it made sense to talk about those different paths, and it made sense to have white people step out of the way of the leadership of the civil rights movement and talk about organizing white people. And at that point, it was young white men who were burning their draft cards, and that's where we ended up. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, and then, you know, that was when uh, Stokely Carmichael started talking about, hell no, we won't go to the draft and the link between racism and, you know, no Vietnamese ever called me nigger was sort of the, the way that people talked about it. Mm -hmm. um, we saw those links and it was a natural progression and it was about a system that, the same system that was responsible for not doing anything about the sheriffs in Mississippi was the same system that was responsible for bombing peasants in Vietnam. And we saw those links and it was still, we were still part of the movement. And then uh, as women in SNCC started to make some demands, the women's movement started to develop. And uh, I, it was a natural progression in that direction. So I was in one of the very early women's consciousness raising groups here in San Francisco. Is that right? And it was, uh, you know, it was just getting together and talking and, and sort of finding strength in each other for the first time instead of being defined by men. Kind of going back a little, did you find sexism in uh, Mississippi in that environment? Uh, that you bit. ever referred to? <laughs> huh? Not a bit, no. There was sexism everywhere. <laughs> no, everywhere. no use in pointing it out there, right. huh? <laughs> okay. So, and, I mean, and, that was the sexism, the first, my, I guess my first struggle against sexism was in arguing that I should have been invited to go target practice. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> That feels so ironic somehow. So but. my first article that I wrote for the movement newspaper was about women in the anti-draft movement. And that was when, right around the same time that I was organizing this women's group, helping to organize it. And, and you also started a national, this, this Lawyers Guild. You I were didn't, involved? No, the Lawyers Guild started in 1937. Oh, it did? Okay. Yeah. So but, explain uh, your involvement. So as I was involved in the anti-war movement, I realize that anytime people are going to make change, they're going to come up against the legal system. So I took on, we organized a, a week of demonstrations called Stop the Draft Week in October 67. And in, in Oakland, we shut down the Oakland Induction Center, that's what we did. And um, we changed the slogan from Hell No, We Won't Go to Hell No, Nobody Goes. And because it wasn't just a matter of individual choice anymore. It was a matter of stopping the machine. And uh, I took on the responsibility of organizing lawyers because we knew there would be arrests. And uh, I started to meet all these young lawyers who had gone to law school out of their political conviction, and they were my peers. And I started to get involved, and, and there was this organization, the National Lawyers Guild, where these young lawyers were... Um, starting to take it over, and I became part of that movement and have been active in the Guild, the Lawyers Guild, since then, since 19... Well, I was the first staff person that opened up the Lawyers Guild office in early 1969 here in San Francisco. And, and um, I'm going to go a little more into your personal story, because you've already brought up you have biracial children. And so, how did that come about? And we know the birds and the bees, but how did you meet your? <laughs> <laughs> well, he and, was, and yeah. was 
this all feels to me a little like coming out of the movement and a, and a spillover out of Mississippi. Well, it was, at a, it was the two parts of my life, which was growing up a product of my time, you know, a child of World War II, and sort of feeling like we could change the world and not accept the old construct, just rejecting the old construct, first rejecting the racist, then rejecting the whole system, then rejecting male and female roles, and rejecting you know, the whole construct. Um, but the other part of my uh, formation was art and dance and, you know, uh, creativity. My mother ended up marrying a, an artist, a, a graphic artist, and so I was surrounded by art and, and dance and poetry and music, and uh, so I taught dance while I was organizing against the war. I had a... a we called it Agiprop Theater, Agitation and Propaganda. I had an Agiprop dance company, and we did anti-war performances around the, the Bay Area. And then uh, I, taught, I used the, the studio of the San Francisco Mime Troupe to teach a dance class. And so I became friends with some of the Mime Troupe people. And then a few years later, I moved back to L.A., and, I, and some of the Mime Troupe, the Mime Troupe was performing in L.A., and they stayed at my house, and I met the man who ended up being the father of my kids. And so we got together. And um, and so just to go back a little with a mime troupe, because I, I think people from San Francisco understand that that's a political, a political um, street theater. theater. Um, Free theater in the parks every summer for okay. 50 years now, right? Still and going on. It's still going on. Yeah. This he was here. the first African-American actor in the mime troupe. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we got together. The Mind Troop did a, a fundraising tour with the National Lawyers Guild, and I was actually I was working in the New York office of the Lawyers Guild at that point. And we got together and started making babies. <laughs> <laughs> and and how did that go with your own family? You um, know, your father, your right. Well, my mother, of course. You know, she couldn't have been happier. Mm -hmm. and, uh, actually, Lonnie, my ex, tells the story. He's six four, and uh, she, my mother was living in Menlo Park then. And he just showed up at her door one day and said, "I'm Lonnie." And she knew all about him, and she and she's like four eleven. So she jumped up and hugged him, you know, just jumped <laughs> into his arms. And he thought, "What have I gotten myself into?" <laughs> but um, my birth father uh, was living uh, in New York, and when I got pregnant, I was in New York, and I sent him a letter um, that, uh, even though I had been seeing him, I decided I didn't want to talk to him directly, so I sent him a letter saying, I'm, I'm having a baby, the baby's father is not white, therefore the, the baby's father is black, therefore the baby will not be white, and I'm not getting married. <laughs> and I said, I hope your racism doesn't prevent you from sharing in my joy. <laughs> I said, I had a design not to get a response. <laughs> exactly. I accomplished what I set out to do. So after the second kid was born, he, he had a hard time denying two grandkids. And he and his wife called. And I said, you know, if you want to have a relationship with me, you have to accept my kids. And uh, his wife said, are they dark? <laughs> I said, yeah, they're really dark. <laughs> but we started to talk, and then I decided to take them to New York so he could meet them. And uh, I have a friend who I'm very close, still very close to, who uh, we were at her house in Brooklyn, and they were supposed to come over, and then his wife called and said he, he doesn't want to see them. And this was, you know, my, my oldest was four years I hadn't seen him. And... Uh, and then one day he showed up at my friend's door because he just was curious. And so uh, my friend Carlin, who actually has the same last name as my mother's maiden name, Meyer, and was convinced that when her family came west to, to the U.S., my family went east from Germany. <laughs> yeah. But uh, she tells the story about how Larry the butcher kicked his grandkids. <laughs> 
because they were playing on the floor and he didn't really want to touch them. And he kind of tapped them with his foot. It was, it was the oddest thing in the world. It was really odd. And years later, when my, ki my kids are very powerful young women, and they were like 14 and 16, and I brought them. He was living in D.C. by then, and I brought them to see him. And I have a picture of him standing between them, and they just would not acknowledge his racism. They just wouldn't. They, it was just like, Grandpa Larry, and they were touching him. <laughs> <laughs> And they're taller than him. <laughs> and there's this picture of them standing on either side of him. And you can see on his face, I want to be the center of attention, but I really don't want these black people touching me. <laughs> you could just see it on his face. And my kids were like, we don't give a shit. You know, we're just going to be who we are. And I learned from them. And I stayed in touch with him for a number of years. And then one day I was at his house when I was in D.C., and he told one racist joke too many. And I realized he was telling this racist joke not out of ignorance but out of meanness. And so I said, I don't need this. I have a father here, you know, the artist. He, he was my father, and he ended up adopting me as an adult. And so, you know, I, what I, with all of these experiences led me to this process of sifting through who is family and who isn't. Who's going to be there for you and who isn't? Who's going to uh, represent safety and who isn't? And a lot of the blood part was not safe for me and was mean and was ugly. And a lot of the, you know, uh, what is it called, you know, when you connect through fire, that was family. And so the, the people my kids grew up with are my, a lot of my women friends from the women's movement who, you know, we've been friends for 40 years now. And we're going to be there for each other, you know, and there's just no question about it. And so we have, it's kind of like full circle because we have recaptured the beloved community. You know, and it's not just women, it's women and men, but it's mostly women. And that's the, that's my family, and that and they're a lot of them are Jewish, but a lot of them aren't. A lot of, some of them are African American, some of them are Latino, Asian. I'm actually I'm leaving for Hawaii tomorrow because one of my Asian friends' daughter is getting married, and she has a daughter. Her my friend who I've been friends with since the '70s, her daughter and my daughter are really close friends, and their daughters are very close friends. Mm -hmm. It's three generations. And so my daughter is Jewish and black, who is now a Muslim. And her daughter is white, Chinese, and Japanese, who had her first kid with a Trinidadian and having her second kid with a Latino. <laughs> so that's the beloved community. Um, I, well, I was going to ask about your, your daughters and if you raised them in a Jewish community. And, um, and then obviously they're a little older now. Maybe you could tell us their names and um, how you raised them and the directions they've gone in. So I mentioned a little bit about the Jewish holidays in my house. They went to after-school care at the Jewish Community Center. Um, and I remember one time ago... They were the only ones who really knew the prayer. <laughs> Nobody else. I mean, I was with a, a close friend and her parents who didn't even know all the rest of the prayer, but my kids knew the prayer. And so, um, but my oldest daughter went to a black women's college back east, and she met her husband there, and she became, and he was African American who was raised a Muslim. His mother had been in the Nation of Islam and realized it was silly and didn't accept the racial. Uh, Part of it, and so she converted to traditional Islam, and and apparently there are communities all across the country of African Americans. Some of whom came out of the Nation of Islam, some of whom uh, just converted because they they saw Islam as not a white religion, and so and it's a community and it's morals. And my uh, my daughter's mother-in-law raised three boys by herself, and none of them got in trouble. They were Boy Scouts, literally Boy Scouts. They were moral. They were honest. They, you know, finished school. They went to college. So my daughter converted. And uh, it was a, a, it was a challenge. 
It was a huge challenge. And uh, why was it a challenge? Well, one, she was worried that I wasn't going to be in heaven with her. <laughs> why is that? Because uh, I wouldn't say I believe in God. I said. And, you know, she she says, the Quran says that Jews and Christians and Muslims will all be in heaven together because we're all children of the book. And I said, look, if there's a God and there's a heaven, you really think God's going to let people into heaven who beat their wives just because they pray five times a day and not let me in? I'll be there. And then her mother-in-law told her that there's a provision for people who live good lives. <laughs> and basically I said... I'm not going down that path with you. That's not who I am. But if you live by the values I raised you with, which is to be kind and generous and try to make the world a better place, then, you know, we can connect. And uh, it took a lot of struggle. Um, but she's been a Muslim now for her daughter's 13. And she, so she's been a Muslim for 15 years. And she's moderated quite a bit. Um, and I realized, I raised her that there aren't any answers, and she needed answers, so this is where she, she found less racial conflict as a biracial kid being in this Muslim community than she found anywhere else, and I think that was one of the attractions for her. She didn't have to pick black or white, she could just be a Muslim. And she didn't experience that anywhere else, not in a Jewish community, not in a political community, not in anything. And I think that was one of the real, she, she was much more conflicted about her biracial state than, any, than my other daughter. Then my other daughter met my first son-in-law's best friend and got married and had to convert to, because he wasn't going to marry a mom. So. so all my four <coughs> granddaughters are Muslim. And uh, years ago, one of them said, Gaga, they call me Gaga. Gaga, are you a Muslim? No, I'm not. I'm Jewish. Isn't everybody supposed to be a Muslim? <laughs> no. <laughs> and my whole approach is I'm there with the love. And we, you know, I'm there with the love, and they know that. And uh, we have, my uh, oldest granddaughter just got back from a special program because she has a learning disability. And she wrote this uh, essay about the family. And she said, my family is a village. You know, they say it takes a village. My family is a village. Uh, we have a family that all the children are cared for by everybody in the family. And she went into a whole description about that. And that's the way we have come back together after going through all these journeys and conflicts. And I mean, there was a period where I, I didn't, I had breast cancer 15 years ago, and my daughter said that, I was doomed, basically, because unless you accept Allah, you, you're doomed. So I said, Kamisha, her name's Kamisha, and my other daughter's name is Taima. Said, Kamisha, you have tested me your entire life, <laughs> but this is about me now, and I'm not going to talk to you. Don't call me. I don't want to talk to you anymore until I get through this. This is about me and getting healthy. She called me the next day and said, Please send me a ticket. I want to come take care of you. I want it to be about you. And she did. She came and she was wonderful. And so, you know, the journey continues, but uh, we're all really close and um, accepting of each other. There's a, there's a core of our family values that everybody accepts, which is tolerance and uh, allowing people to find their own path, but never disconnecting. I learned that, actually. Um, I had a very close friend who was part of this lawyer's guild group of women who died of breast cancer many years ago, and she was my closest friend. And she reached a state just before she died where she was, ne the last week of her life, she was never without holding somebody's hand. She was connected right up until the end, but she always knew it was a solo trip, that no one was going with her. And she found some peace in that balance. And that balance has been the, my guide through the, my life since then. It's finding that balance between feeling connected to your heritage, to your community, to the world, and still being independent and self-reliant. And that, that's 
to me has been my lifelong struggle of finding that balance. Okay, I think it's time um, to wrap up, and I'm sorry if I took a little too long. It's so interesting, and I, there might be questions. Is there time for questions, Gail? Yes, I think we have about 12 minutes.